Okay, trying something new here at the Substack. Uh, I'm doing a little uh, video chat with my friend Matt Page. Uh, we've known each other for a couple decades, um, yeah. at least, I think. Um, and uh, through various online forums or fora, I think would be the more Latin way to say it. And um, uh, he and I have been I, going back at least as far as The Passion of the Christ, all the controversy around that film. And we were discussing it online and and... Um, Matt and I both have an interest in Bible films in a big way. Uh, we've uh, done a lot of, we've written a lot of um, uh, essays for books on uh, bu books about Bible films. And Matt has actually written an entire book. This is his book, 100 Bible Films. And um, I, I have to admit, I haven't gone through the whole book yet because, um, I mean, I, I kind of want to watch the films as I'm going through it. And yeah, and it's that kind so, of book, isn't it, where you don't don't always yeah. you know you kind of read the films as you go along yeah there's like i mean two pages do any of these go longer than two pages like no they're all they're all four? within two two pages all two there's no three or four page one no 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 yeah so, so I, um i mean i've seen a lot of those films obviously and so i've read some of those hmm. chapters but but there's um uh, a lot of films i haven't seen uh uh Matt has a special interest in the uh, the silent era, and there's a lot of silent films. Which, um, in in some ways, the silent era is. Um, I, I've heard I've heard you point this out before, Matt. The fact that the silent era it's like thirty years. There's thirty mm. years of film film history that a lot of people just don't pay attention to, and yeah. for Bible films, it's actually like uh, one of the most um, uh, dynamic uh, periods because, for one thing, the rules haven't been set yet. And the yeah. canon, you know, the canon, quote unquote, of the stories that you tell over and over again hadn't quite settled yet. And I think also because silent film is so visual, um, it was easy to make a lot of films that played off of different kinds of iconography. Um, yeah. You know, just you, you could put these <clears throat> iconographic images on the screen and people would respond to them the same way they would respond to picture books and things. And and, and plus a lot, there were a lot of shorter films back then. You didn't have to make every film two hours long or three hours no, long. No, and and uh, I mean, a lot of those, I mean, there were kind of 90, I think, within a, within a period between 1908 and 1913, I think it is. But yeah. you know, nearly all of those were kind of 10, 20 minute films, um, which are obviously they're a little bit easier to to knock out than uh, something like, you know, the Ten Commandments it was in 1956. So, right. um, or, you know, well, or, a lot or of any of the later stories... films, yeah. Well, a lot of Bible stories are fairly brief. And, yeah. you know, if you're going to make a two hour film out of them, you got to really pad them out. And mm. obviously, if you're making a short film, you don't have to. You can, but you don't have to. Yeah. Um, so there's more freedom and flexibility. Anyway, that's all um, just to, by way of constantly shifting my attention. You're talking to Matt and I'm talking about Matt. But anyway, <laughs> um, so that, that's all by way of just sort of underlining some of uh, some of uh, the special um, uh, interests that Matt has and and some of the, the various aspects of Bible films that uh, we can get into. Um, but the reason we're talking right now, the immediate reason we're talking right now um, is the Book of Clarence, which is the um, a film that premiered in London last week at the London Film Festival. It was going to come out in theaters a month ago, and then they delayed it. Uh, didn't give a reason for delaying it, but it's been delayed now to January. So in January, it's yeah. going to get its big wide theatrical release. But in the meantime, they did premiere it in London um, just last week. And you being um, British, I'm, I'm, where do you live exactly? Uh, I'm in England, near, near Leicester, kind of between Leicester and Nottingham. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. When I went to England 30 odd years ago, I, I went to a train station and asked somebody for directions to Leicester. And he had no idea what I was talking about <laughs> until I pointed to the map and he went, Oh, you mean Leicester. So I just, you know. anyway, that's, I always associate that town with that yeah. incident now. <laughs> but um, so, uh, and you, it's, I mean, it's where we found Richard III. That's our, our claim to fame <laughs> these days. So. Oh, is is that where the famous "My Horse, yeah. My Kingdom for a Horse"? That's where that happened. Well, that that's where the bat battlefield was, but also um, finding the finding the they found it. We found his bones about oh. a decade ago uh, in a, under oh, really? under a car park. Yeah, I, I, okay. it was it, well. It was it was a big story around here anyway. But I thought it was I thought it had gone quite internationally. They uh, oh. 
I mean, we could talk about this another time, but they they basically were able to they, they kind of found they found some bones in a possible likely thing, but then they were able to use kind of DNA um, to kind of link it back to actually prove that it was was him. Well, that's um, fascinating. It's it's an unbelievable set of coincidences in terms of like really a series of un highly unlikely things coming together, but. Um, that's maybe fascinating. We can, do that. maybe we can do that in another podcast. No, um, but, but I have to tell another story now from when I went to England 30 odd years ago. Um, I went to Scotland, I think, and was it Edinburgh where the tour guide pointed out that John Knox, I think, is buried under a parking lot there? Oh, right. Or yeah, something? Pro quite probably. Yeah. I've, <laughs> okay. I've, I've been to Edinburgh a few times, but I've not done the, uh, not done okay. the John Knox tour. But... Okay. So whenever you go to a British parking lot, you see these oil patches. They might be oil patches or there could be something rising <laughs> from the ground. You, know, you never know. <laughs> So anyway, um, it, 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 I'm tempted to say that Matt is my man in Europe because uh, when <laughs> Risen came out, you know, the, the, with Joseph Fiennes playing a Roman who investigates the resurrection, Risen came out seven years ago and uh, there yeah. was a screening in Italy, I think, and you went to that and yeah. then wrote about it, uh, you know, wrote about it, I think, for my blog or did I link to it, link to your blog on that one? Uh, I, I'm trying to. I can't quite remember. I think I wrote up the uh, the Q and A. There was a Q and A after the after the screening, and I think I right. wrote that up, and that appeared on your site. I think, but I, I can't. Okay. I honestly can't quite remember. But. Okay. And um, and now Book of Clarence. You've had a chance mm -hmm. to see it. I have not, and yeah. I, I've read as much as I can about it. But uh, you know, I thought it could be an interesting uh, subject to talk about. Yeah, well, certainly, I I had the sense watching it that I just thought, oh, I really, I really want to talk to Peter about this because it's, you know, it's 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 such, I mean, it's such a film for the kind of lovers of biblical films and biblical epics like us. And you know, the uh, the director James Samuels is obviously a you know, he's, he's obviously a big Bible films buff himself, and he's he's kind of mm -hmm. talked about he talked about that a little bit. There was a t he did a tiny intro to the screening I went to. It didn't. Didn't go to the premiere or the gala screening, but there was a tiny, a tiny intro that he did, um, and and yeah, right, you know, the first, the the first kind of opening sequence. There's kind of a, a series of like little tips of the hat to various various Bible films that had had me uh, kind of grinning grinning from ear to ear before it even really got started. So, yes, yeah. <clears throat> I, I just think we should also mention just for the viewer uh, who might not know much about this. Um, the Book of Clarence. How is the Book of Clarence a Bible film? What, where does the name Clarence come in? And this is this is a movie that basically um, it's not to oversimplify, but it's sort of like um, um, it's it's a it's a it's it's kind of like Life of Brian or Ben Hur. It's a story that takes place to the side of the gospel story, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And I Clarence. Think ben has... Sorry, go on. Well, then I was just going to say uh, the director James Samuel. He's um, he, he's black, grew up in Britain, and he's cast a mostly black cast in the film, similar to what he did with his previous film, The Harder They Fall, where yeah. it was a Western with, that focused on black cowboys and cowgirls and sort of tried to um, uh, show that side of the Western genre, which has not often been shown in films in the yeah. past. And here he's doing something similar, although it sounds like from the, from the re remarks of his that I've read, it sounds like with the heart of a fall, he was taking actual black historical figures that have been ignored. He was trying to sort of correct our perception of history. Yeah. Whereas with this film, it sounds more like um, he just wants to make a Bible story that's relatable to people who grew up the way he did. And in a way, that almost sounds like what's happening with the the chosen and these other things that are happening right now that are yeah. sort of like taking Bible stories and making them relatable to modern audiences, you know. Because in the yeah, chosen, you have seen where Mary Magdalene goes to a hair salon and stuff like that, and yeah, <laughs> does that happen in this film too? Um, I don't. I, I vaguely remember there being some chat about that beforehand, but I, I didn't. Um, there, there is a. I think there's a brief scene in, in what might be kind of classed as a hair salon, but um, okay. but but yeah, but it's not. It's not. It's not very anachronistic like that. There's. I mean, you know, there are from a kind of purist historian point of view there's obviously you know there's plenty of anach anachronisms all, all over the place but and and part of that is part of the fun of the film as much as it you know it's it's um it's not that it's trying but being sloppy it, you know it's not hugely concerned with 
reproducing a kind of you know this is exactly how it was kind of thing um and <clears throat> and and what the director seems like he's doing is almost kind of like as you say it's kind of similar but also different to the holiday fall he's trying to kind of scoop up that life that you know the kind of community he grew he grew up in and kind of like translate it back into and kind of drop it in the middle of a biblical epic almost um, or a comedy biblical epic um and so so yeah so i think with the harder they fall as you've said it, he was very much trying to say actually you know um african americans were all you know were all over the place in the wild west they've just been generally ignored and had their stories written out whereas this was quite a different thing of um, you know, he, he talks about wanting to take his kind of the life of his community and kind of transporting it back into that into that context. Um, and I think partly because he, you know, he, he loves those he loves those films so much. So, yeah, I, I saw a video clip of a of one of the intros he did or a Q and A yeah. he did at the festival. And um, if you're a Bible movie geek, uh, you know, he said things just voluntarily that the interviewer wasn't even pressing him on that yeah. just kind of made my eyes light up. Because at one point, because um, in, in this film, Omar Sy from Lupin, he plays uh, Barabbas, right? Mm, yeah. And at one at one point in the interview, um, James Samuel just says, you know, I think in Zeffirelli's film, um, um, uh, uh, Stacy Keach played Barabbas, and he was played by Anthony Quinn in another movie. And I thought, wow! Like, I don't know how yeah. many people would even, if you know, Stacy Keach played Barabbas in Zeffirelli's film. How many people would even string together a set of words like that? Yeah, I, I think if you'd asked me who played, because I don't know Stacy Keach apart from uh, from Jesus Nazra, I, I might have struggled to to name him to be honest. So yeah, that. That stood out to me as well. Um, as soon you know, as soon as he says, "Oh yeah, oh yeah," that's, you know, that rings a bell. But but yeah, that's some, it's some good, it's some good insider knowledge. And as I say, right at the start, there's you know, the, there's a kind of, I mean, it opens on a kind of a, an, an array of crosses, which is, um, it, I mean, I suppose if you take that the ending of life of Brian is a kind of takeoff of Spartacus, then it's 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 that kind of territory. Instantly, it feels like that kind of territory. And then you get these um, these credits, which feel very much like the kind of the robe and, and Barabbas of a kind of, you know, um, <laughs> imperial colour with the kind of the gold lettering on the top. Uh, and then there's a and then there's a kind of little uh, subtitle on the thing that says, um, and unfortunately, I you know, wasn't able to remember as much of the details as I like, but it, it was worse the effect of that, the same thing at the start of Life of Brian at the Sermon of the Mount, where it says, you know, Saturday afternoon at tea time, you know, tea time or something it was you know it's, it, it, again it kind of felt like this is this is doing the same joke with a kind of nod of the hat and then it, and then it goes into this um ben-hur stroke prince of egypt kind of chariot mm -hmm. race around the streets of uh of matera which you know matera itself has got this got this huge legacy now of biblical films um being shot there and uh one of the things that i really enjoyed about it um is is you see so much more of the city and get so much better sense of that city mm. than you do from from the other films you may have seen there. Um, and it was kind of interesting there. You know, there was one bit that was like, oh, this was this bit was in in Mary Magdalene, and then there's another bit. It's like, oh, this bit was in was in oh. um, uh, Pasolini's Evangelist Secondo Matteo. Um, and but I can now see how those two bits relate to each other because you know it's so the the yeah Matera really forms part of the it almost feels like a character in the film in itself in a way that i mean you I mean, people would say that about um pasolini's film as well but i think even more so it's it's uh, really surprising how how strongly hmm. featured it is i think okay um the uh how does it compare to hail caesar you know hail caesar is like that also came out about seven years yeah. ago right around this that was weird hail caesar came out like just within a month or two of risen risen plays a kind of like in some ways it plays like the robe which is like this old 50s richard burton film yeah. where he's you know the roman who killed jesus and dealing with the aftermath of that and then hail caesar came out at the same time and hail caesar has direct nods to things like the robe and um and quo Vadis and all those 50s yeah. films um and well, so the hail caesar takes yeah well, I was going to say the main shot you see of um, of the actual film that George Clooney is in is a really close reproduction of the start of Quo Vadis. Um, mm -hmm. If I've yeah, if I'm remembering largely, it's a really close reproduction of something anyway. And I think it's the 1951 Quo Vadis. Um, uh, 
Where, and the, whereas this is, but but I think then a lot of the kind of the fifties geekery around it is is much more kind of behind the scenes. I think you, you don't um, you yeah. don't see that much uh, on on set, and it's always yeah. And it's it, I think it's much more interested with the process of making uh, biblical epics rather than um, dwelling too much. Whereas whereas here, um, James Samuel I think is is more kind of having fun with the ideas in front of the cameras i think so it feels like he's more you know as i said there's various it kind of nods all the way through to different bits and you'll you know you kind of see bits and say oh yeah that's the the slave you know the, the gladiator training slave bit from from spartacus for example right now you mentioned um, spartacus oh sorry yeah you, you were still no i, I was done <laughs> okay okay uh, you've mentioned Spartacus a couple times now, yeah. and I, I noticed that the the love interest in the film is apparently named Verinia, which is yeah. the name of the Gene Simmons character in Spartacus, Stanley Kubrick's Spartacus. Yeah. Um, what do you, I mean, how, what do you make of that? The fact that Spartacus keeps getting lumped into these Bible movie categories when it's actually set a hundred years before the time of Christ, and it doesn't really, I mean, I, technically it's not a Bible film, but, but it keeps no, getting lumped not. in with these things. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a kind of is it isn't it it kind of film. I mean, it, it, I didn't. Um, yeah, I it, it was one. Of, I never considered it for my book, for example. And I, you know, I had quite strong rules around that being um, stuff that was related to at least one biblical character. Um, but I think it also, in another way, it kind of fits because it 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 well because of the crucifixion scenes at the end, um, and and because of, I guess because of the conventions of the genre. And that sense of anticipation in it somehow feels that it, it somehow feels that even though, as you say, it is a hundred years before, that it kind of belongs, belongs with those films like the Rome and Quo Vadis, which are heavy on Rome, but have a, you know, a decent tip of the hat towards towards Christianity. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's you know, I mean, think people agree with that or disagree with that, I think, um, but it's. Uh, but yeah, it, I can see why I can certainly see why he would he would you know bump it up with the others, um, even if uh, some of us might be a bit like yeah, but is it <laughs> is it is it really? But because it kind of I think it it's one of those things. It feels like it belongs, even if even if it's difficult to you know if you had a form in front of you, you kind of tick, had to tick boxes off to say say whether it qualifies or not. It it doesn't really, but um yeah okay um talking about the fact or uh wondering if we could talk about the fact that uh this is a film with like a mostly black cast and mm. the significance of that and i fully recognize this is two white guys talking about this so yeah. um may maybe not the ideal perspective but you know we're bible movie fans and we we study this stuff and um and uh i've seen some reviews that make the assumption that people are going to find this controversial. Personally, I don't. Um, mm. Partly because uh, I I just assume that the, the biblical stories are going to be appropriated by everybody. I assume that everybody's yeah. going to make their own version. I mean, you in your book, you you and I've written about this elsewhere too. You know, there's uh, Bible movies that have been made in Iran, and there's Bible movies that have been made in India, and mm. um, there's uh, that great uh, film, I forget which particular country it was, but uh, Genesis by Suzoko. Um, yeah, Mali. Mali, okay. And uh, there's, like, biblical films have been made in many countries and, and in, throughout um, throughout the world, and whenever people make Bible movies, they, they adapt them to their current, uh, to whatever their local audience or culture is, and sometimes, I mean, in the case of uh, the film from Mali, I thought it was fascinating to get this sort of like nomadic tribal mm. story of the Genesis patriarchs transposed to a different kind of nomadic uh, tribal sort of setting. And um, uh, and so, you know, if you, a, a film like this, I don't see why, it, I, I mean, I know why it would be controversial because there are always people who find things controversial. But, but to me, this, I mean, um, this just seems like, um, oh, okay, you know, this is a story that's been told many, many, many times. Why not tell it this way? And yeah. um, <clears throat> especially because th this is where it gets potentially dicey. Um, I, 
like in the case of Harder They Fall, he's trying to sort of correct our perception of history. Mm. If he was trying to do that with this film, I would have a problem with that because to me, the biblical characters are, um, my big complaint for years has been, why aren't actual Middle Easterners playing these characters? I, I can yeah. remember when, you know, when, when the Jesus film came out back in 1979, I was I was nine years old back then. And I, I actually, I got the novelization of that film which is weird because the film was supposed to be based word for word on the book of Luke. So why is there a novelization of it? But anyway, I still have that novelization. Um, and in, in either in the novelization or in some of the other materials around that film, there was a lot of talk about how they went out of their way for accuracy. They filmed it in Israel as yeah. close to the locations as possible. They took down telephone poles because they wanted that's That's how dedicated they were to getting as close as possible to where the things happened. And as part of that drive for accuracy, they cast almost all the actors were Yemenite Jews because the, the producers figured that Yemenite Jews were the closest ethnically in appearance to the first century Jews of Palestine. Yeah. And yet Jesus himself <laughs> was played by Brian Deacon. Yeah. A bloke from a white bloke from Oxford. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, you know, could not be more. Yeah. Exactly. It's very... and, and as a, as a nine-year-old, I thought, well, why make an exception for him? And, and so yeah. this has been, this has been a thing that I've been conscious of. And, and, you know, when the nativity story came out 20 years ago, 17 years ago, uh, the nativity story um, made a point of cat. There were a number of Palestinian and Middle Eastern actors in there and others who could pass for Middle Eastern. And I thought that was great. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're going to make a film that harps on the notion of accuracy, that's sort of where my own interests would lie. Yeah. But if you're making a film that basically says, you know, we're just telling the story a different way, then mm. okay, I can I can run with that. And yeah. um uh and 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 so it seems it sounds like that's what this film is doing. Um and uh especially if like it's got all these it does have some anachronistic bits like apparently a light bulb goes off that over Clarence's head, like an actual light bulb. Yeah, or... it's um I mean it's a kind of uh it's not a real light bulb, but it's a yeah, but it's a kind of it's a kind oh, okay. of image um it's like kind of i'm trying to think how how best to describe it it's it's clearly a light bulb but it, it's it's you know it's clearly a work of imagination rather than a kind of a literal um thing as well so it's um yeah yeah but it, but you know it's very it's, it's for the audience rather than well i don't know yeah i'm not sure i can explain it any better than that really but um but yeah yeah so okay. yeah so there are there are yeah as i said there are kind of anachronisms in there and sometimes sometimes joyfully so and slightly slightly surreally so i mean i mean i mean it, it's destined as a film to get compared to the life of brian i think and similarly in life of brian you have anachronistic moments as well um particularly obviously when the spaceship um comes zooming down and there's there's moments like that in the in the film as well and so i think i do think those films i do think there's a difference between when a film sets its stall out to say and very often it's a marketing thing, but nevertheless to say, you know, we've made this really historically accurate film. We've got these scholars on board. We've kind of, I mean, I can't remember the lines that Mel Gibson said when he was doing his, but, you know, right down to the detail and all these other things and it ends up, you know, oh yeah, but then we'll just, we'll just brown out Jim Caviezel's eyes. For the, right. For, 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 you know, I, I, I have a bit of a problem with those films, I think. Um, the, uh, well, I think, you know, I, I think as, there's a, as you think... say, seem to kind of go to these ridiculous lengths and then just make the most obvious faux pas in that sense but yeah i think there is a strong tendency to expect film to be realistic um mm. a lot of people will deny this if you if you put it if you state it that you know blat blatantly if you people expect films to be realistic and a lot of people will go well yeah. no 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 we we know films are made up and that's that's true we know that but i think i think there is a strong temptation or expectation with film to think that film like this film there's a, there's a documentary quality to film you are photographing yeah. something and it's not like theater where you you, you know theaters uh, st stage productions very often have very sparse stages or there's, mm. there's there's a definite air of artificiality about it and and so when you go to a play you're very much aware that you and the actors are entering into entering into a shared imaginative space film is a little more there's the image and we're watching it and we're looking at something somebody photographed and 
And with that photography, my feeling is that people expect film to be a little more documentary, like it has to portray reality the way it really is. And so when you make a film about the past, people start getting really upset if anything in that portrayal of the, of the past gets a little bit wrong. So unless you're making, yeah, like if you're I think, making, a, I think comedy you know, is a bit more of an exception in that respect, though. Yes. I think people people don't watch, you know, when they watch historical com comedies, they don't, you know, they cut some more slack. I mean, one of the surprising things about Life of Brian is that it is one of the more more accurate uh, Jesus films. But but as a general rule, you know, people don't watch Blazing Saddles and you know right. think about those things and and, and or um, you know um, Year One and, and, and to choose another biblical example or. The one I remembered since I wrote my review for this film is uh, Green Pastures as, as well, uh, which is another kind of oh. um, uh, black cast uh, comedy comedy drama. So, and I'm, um, so I think I'm I think when, I'm going to get to that, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I, I think when people sit down, I think you very quickly you realise this is not a this is not a film which I'm going to take on board before I I sit my uh, history fan it's a you know it's it's a kind of fun exploration of the past i guess and some of the some of the stuff that we do those things and so i think it yeah it, it's in a very different ball camp um ballpark to to some of the you know to some of the other films that are pitching a much more serious um take on it um i think, I think also, it's almost so... that it's almost mm -hmm. that kind of comedy element which i think is perhaps got some people a bit a bit you know spooked about the film I mean, i think you know you're kind of saying that it might be controversial with some playing jesus is black but i think also the kind of the comedy and the uh, you know the right. kind of irreverence might get um might concern oh. some people as well but okay yeah um another another uh film that i often think of in these contexts also is jesus christ superstar because that yeah it's it's not i wouldn't call that a comedy but jesus christ superstar is a musical and musicals mm -hmm. often get lumped with comedies but that particular musical is a fairly serious one and yeah. but be, but being a musical i mean there, there's a level of artistic abstraction there built into it and so and of course on top of that everybody's wearing modern clothes and you've mm. got israeli tanks in the background and <laughs> it's like yeah it's, and you have so that framing was, device of them getting on and off the bus at the yeah. start and the end of the film as well so yeah so nobody nobody looks at that film and expects historical accuracy so that film actually has a multi-racial cast and nobody cares mm. yeah. um and uh but with some of these other like you know net there was a huge controversy recently with netflix they made a, a series about cleopatra and yeah. it was hugely controversial in egypt um um because it was felt that they had misrepresented the historical cleopatra's uh race um because yeah. the historical cleopatra she was an egyptian queen descended from macedonians and the actress who played her was not that and yeah. and in egypt they took that very 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 seriously so anyway mm. um the What's, one of the things I find interesting is that James Samuel and, and others have talked about how this film, like James Samuel, the way he talks about this film, he sometimes says things like, um, uh, oh, and just to let you know, Zoom is telling me we have 10 minutes left. So let's see what we can. All right. I've got the free Zoom. I, I, haven't, yeah. I haven't upgraded. I don't have enough. <laughs> I don't have a big enough budget for that. Um, so the uh, uh James Samuel has said things like, you've never seen characters like this in a Bible film before. And I think he's implying that we've never seen Black actors in a Bible film before. And like you and I know, that's simply not true. And in fact, there are at least two actors in the Book of Clarence who have been in Bible movies before. Yeah, Both Jesus and John the Baptist are played by actors who have been, uh, the uh, Nicholas Pinnock who plays Jesus, he was in AD, the Bible continues, playing a zealot. Mm -hmm. And uh, David Oyelowo, I hope I pronounced that right. Correct. I hope I pronounced that correct. Correct. Right. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Um, he uh, he played uh, Joseph of Arimathea in The Passion, the BBC's Passion. Yeah. So it's not that we've never seen this before. Um, just we've never seen a film that was perhaps as you know majority um, black as as this particular film is. But even then, setting aside films that were made in Africa, perhaps. Um, yeah, I mean, or a film I, I like wonder Color if, of the Cross. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if he, yeah, and and the Green Pastures, as we said, um, I, I wonder if he he mean when he says he's 
does he, I can't remember if he said characters or not, but I wonder if that he means in terms, yeah, he, he means characters rather than um, faces, I suppose. So, because they are, yeah, there is, there's a kind of level of comic exaggeration to a lot of the, a lot of the characters, not, uh, not so much Jesus, but, but certainly um, the, the kind of non-biblical characters like Clarence and um, his friends, uh, um, Elijah and Zeke. Um, and some, you know, and some of the other characters as well, I think they, and because it is, it is this thing of taking that kind of area of London where he, he grew up and transporting it back. It, it feels like, I can yeah, I can kind of see how he might be claiming that you know we don't usually see that kind of person on on the uh, um, okay. in biblical in biblical epics um, or it might be that he's talking perhaps to a an audience that hasn't watched the uh, does <laughs> hasn't geeked out quite as much as we have on these in these films so they haven't haven't necessarily watched all these uh, these other portrayals they they kind of know the fifties and sixties yeah. Hollywood ones but aren't so familiar with. This like would certainly be the course. highest profile, I think. Uh, certainly coming mm. from a major studio, uh, Sony yeah. Pictures. Green Pastures, I was going to bring that up because I was thinking about like past examples of Black actors doing Bible stories. And, you know, you, you have like Sidney Poitier played Simon of Cyrene in 1965's The Greatest Story Ever mm. Told. And you, you've got uh, isolated examples like that. Usually Simon of Cyrene or the Magi were the bit where that's where you yeah. often found it in the past. Green Pastures is interesting because it's an Old Testament film predominantly but it ends with uh, God, essentially. Um, everybody's played by black actors. God is played by one. Um, Adam, Noah, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're, they're all, it's an all black cast. And at the end of the film, God uh, looks off into the distance and sees a man. And we know that he's looking at Jesus, but we don't see Jesus mm -hmm. himself. And my initial, my initial reaction when I saw that film was, well, you know, this this was made in the 1930s. The Green Pastures was made in the 1930s. And Jesus movies, um, uh, uh, there there were a lot of Jesus movies in the silent era. But since the rise of sound, talking pictures, um, people had sort of, in Hollywood at least, had kind of stopped making Jesus movies. And so Jesus yeah. was kept off screen. Nobody really knew what to do with Jesus as a walking talking talking like you know sound and visuals how do you combine that no, nobody really knew how to tackle that yet but then thinking about it some more i thought you know this is interesting because what if that film had actually shown jesus and jesus presumably would have had to be played by a black actor just like everybody else was in that film and would that have been controversial like would, yeah. would somehow making jesus have been more controversial than making god or moses or whoever you know, a black actor in the 1930s. Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting thought, you know, thought exercise, isn't it? And I know some people have have written about the fact that Jesus doesn't appear as as kind of almost implying that it perhaps, at least in the minds of the the writers and directors who were white, that that perhaps for them Jesus was still was still white somehow, and that was a, hmm. um, you know, a, a kind of or you know an implication. Well. An inference, even if it wasn't implied, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, but, but yeah, I think it does. It does. It does kind of raise that question because I think it. Yeah, it somehow feels a bit. Generally, it feels a bit more serious, um, even than you know. There are kind of a lot of most of the portrayals of God, where God is actually portrayed as a person, tend to have a, a comic angle to them. I think, at least in some sense, you don't get many uh, serious portrayals of of god in in film where you know where he's personified so so uh, yeah i wonder if it's kind of partly linked i don't know linked with that whole thing yeah i mean the green pastures also it's not going for historical realism either because you've got characters no. wearing modern clothes and it's yeah. it's very much a sort of a quasi-modernized um well again you've got the kind of framing device of it being in the heads of uh, children in a sunday school scenario that's right um, yeah. So again, it kind of it, it has that arm's length distance. Yeah. So so there's a, just a few more things, a few more aspects of the film I'd like to get into. One thing I'm really curious mm. about: I've long had an interest in the family of Jesus and yeah. how it's portrayed in the film. Usually, we just see Mary, and we also get Joseph in the Christmas story, and that's kind of it usually. Yeah. Um, there was a film, uh, The Color of the Cross. Uh, 
almost 20 years ago, which um, was also a, uh, a Black Jesus movie, if I can put it that way. And in that film, as I recall, Mary and Joseph were still alive right up until the end, uh, right up until like, like, usually Joseph, Joseph is never described in the Gospels when Jesus is an adult. So yeah. the default assumption a lot of people have is that Joseph died somewhere between I mean, jo Joseph is there when Jesus goes to the temple at the age of 12, and we never hear yeah. about him after that. So the assumption is he died somewhere. Hmm. And, and in the uh, Roger Young Jesus film, we get we get Joseph dying right before the start of Jesus' ministry, and that almost being the kind of catalyst for the start of Jesus' ministry, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so, no, that, that's... But... Um, yes. And uh, I think Zeffirelli also shows Joseph dying right around the time jesus gets baptized or just before jesus get, gets baptized oh, yeah um and uh um whereas color of the cross joseph is just there along with mary and mm -hmm. um and, oh and of course the absence of joseph is also assumed because in john's gospel when jesus is on the cross he tells the beloved disciple you know this is your mother basically the, the beloved disciple traditionally believed to be john looks after mary after jesus is gone yeah. And obviously that wouldn't have been necessary if jo if Mary's husband was still alive. Um, however, in Color of the Cross, Joseph is still there. And apparently in the Book of Clarence, we meet Mary and Joseph also mm. at this time during Jesus's adult ministry. So I'm very yeah. curious to know how do they handle that. Like what's going on there? Well, um, we don't actually, I mean, we don't see them there with Jesus. So uh, you know, the, the essential plot of the film is uh, Jesus is in his in in his kind of ministry phase of ministry. He's getting popular. There's a you know large kind of crowds starting to follow him because of his miracles and so on. Uh, Clarence, on the other hand, is you know kind of down on his luck a bit. He's kind of in debt. He owes money. He's trying to work out a way to get this kind of money money back. He sees what Jesus is doing. He is skeptical that about you know jesus's miracles he doesn't believe jesus is actually doing miracles and he kind of essentially thinks well if if jesus can fake these miracles then i can fake some miracles and you know and i can earn people can follow me and i can earn earn money from it that way and pay off my earth my debts um and so he's trying to kind of work out how jesus does it so well so he you know he kind of has he has his friends being stooges and kind of you know pretending you know walking with a bit of a limp and then um being okay but he kind of quickly um you know is trying to kind of get to it and he's convinced that jesus is is faking so he goes to see mary and joseph uh and asks and asks them about it um and so that's kind of how the scenario arises and so he's kind of asking them about jesus and they of course say you know no he's he, he's kind of always been special and they actually tell the story of uh, from the infancy infancy gospel of uh, Thomas about about Jesus converting the clay bird into a you know into a real bird, um, <clears throat> which is which also is kind of in that's also in Roger Young's Jesus film, or yeah. at least the version of it. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, and mm. it's it crops in a few as well. I think it did it. Um, the young Messiah. Yeah, yeah, it comes up in that. And I've got a feeling I saw it in something else recently as well. I can't remember what it was. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, it feels like that's getting a bit more popularity as a story recently. But um, actually, but, sorry, sorry, just I, I think the young Messiah, it might not be a clay bird. That might be just a healed bird. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. there's another one. I can't think what it is off the top of my head. Anyway. I know there is at least one right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. There's a number of Italian movies that, that look at sort of yeah. young or or that the holy family or whatever and I, but i can't remember yeah. which one it was specifically no no i i wrote a whole book chapter on those films and i, I can't remember it either but uh but yeah um anyway so it's uh so it's a really yeah so it's interesting as you say just because it's quite unusual to see the adult joseph at that stage he's very much a kind of secondary character to mary um i think that, i think that, i really like the portrayal of mary actually in this film i think it might be one of my one of my favorites um certainly of the kind of mary from jesus's adult ministry um it's just a good mix of i suppose partly you know a kind of well played character um but also seems to have a kind of i mean we get this 
we get this thing in the Gospels that that Mary is kind of on the scene a little bit, but she's not she's not really presented as being in the thick of it until until Jesus' passion. Um, and some filmmakers make a lot of the bit where Jesus says, you know, who is my mother and so on. Um, but I don't think that, you know, necessarily it suggests as big a rift as is sometimes made out. Um, and I think, and, and possibly this is something I think about slightly differently after watching the film, but it kind of feels like, yeah, you know, Jesus is my adult son. He's off doing his, you know, things. He loses his own life. He, you know, probably get together for, for family dues and see each other and so on. But but it doesn't feel like she's kind of, you know, her life is dependent on him and in in that in that way. Um, so yeah, so so I, I kind of really like it. it. Kind of feels like it because I think some of the films they have this very, so slightly mawkish version of Mary who's you know feeding. Oh, I don't know, maybe a bit too clingy. I'm not quite sure, but it's um, but it yeah, it feels like it's quite a nice balance. It's, you know, um, she's very well, very well acted. I can't remember the the name of the actor, and and she, but her role is fairly, is fairly straight, I think. And then that is contrasted with the role of Joseph, who I think gets some of the best lines in the in the whole thing. Um, so, uh, uh, he, you know, he just gets a kind of couple because because Clarence and his friends are you know. Are not portrayed, um, not portrayed usually. Yeah, they're kind of seen as a, you know, a kind of group of no hopers who eventually kind of come good, but they're not, you know, they're they're not they're not your kind of classic, your classic heroes that you know are instantly you're instantly on side with them. They're they're kind of, you know, are they hustlers? Are they kind of you know they do they do some drugs? They don't have kind of steady employment. They're they're portrayed. They're still, yeah, they're kind of portrayed with warmth, and you kind of warm to them and like them. But they're not, you know, they're not pre presented as noble and, and wise. Um, and and so, you know, and and so so Joseph kind of, and 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 so when Mary and Joseph are saying to them, "No, look, Jesus is actually, is actually doing these miracles," and they're they're still saying, "But how's he? How's he managed to fake this one?" Um, then then Mary is is perhaps a bit more forbearing, whereas. Whereas Joseph says, um, I think my favourite line of his was, um, "If you were at all in my carpenter's box, you wouldn't be the sharpest." <laughs> is, uh, right. is what, so it's kind of quite an yeah. So it's quite an interesting contrast, um, and and I suppose it's kind of interesting that you know Joseph finally gets into a film and he's there probably for a bit more of a comic relief, whereas Mary is is still is still the more revered figure, which I suppose reflects church tradition in that way. Um, not the comic relief, but the the kind of greater deference for mary does the film get into the brothers and sisters of jesus at all um Do mary and joseph have other children in this film i yeah i can't remember if i'm absolutely honest they're certainly not very prominent and i think this is one of the things that i think one of the people that reviewed it wrote a slightly misleading uh statement about it i wasn't sure whether they misunderstood or whether they just phrased it badly but they some people have got the that I spoke to have got the impression that Clarence was Jesus's twin, rather than um, oh. rather than Thomas's twin, um, yeah. which is you know it's just a flat out mistake. And 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 um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean Thomas, Thomas is sometimes called Didymus, isn't he? And and am I right? I think I'm right in thinking that both those words mean the twin. Yes, yeah. Thomas like is Aramaic. Didymus is Greek, but they both mean yeah. twin. Yeah. 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 So it's a, it's a bit like Thomas, who was also the twin, who was also known as the twin. Um, so it, it kind of, so it riffs on, it riffs on this. So uh, Lakeith Stanfield, who's playing Clarence, is also playing Thomas, um, who right. is in the, in the disciples. But, um, but yeah, so I don't, uh, I couldn't say point blank that there are no, there's not, you know, some children hanging around that are related to, to Jesus, but yeah, you know, that there's relates to Mary and Joseph, thing. but 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 I don't, but I yeah, there's not much of a sense of that. Um, but my memory's not what it was, so maybe I missed something. Does Lakeith Stanfield appear as both characters in the frame at the same time? Uh, yes, yeah, there's one scene where they're kind of face to face and, and we see them in side profile. And there's a critic who missed that and who still thought that Lakeith was playing Jesus's twin, not <clears throat> the other Lakeith's twin. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether I, I can't. Now, what is it they, 
Not that I want to go after this other critic. Yeah, no, I I think it, I can't. Firstly, I can't remember whether they had actually seen it or not. I think they had. And I can't remember. It might have been the way it was phrased grammatically led some people to some people to mis misread it. Um, And so because I also heard that he was Peter's Peter's, you know, someone else saying he was Peter's twin. But I know that was a different a different one. But right. Um, Speaking as a Peter myself, I have to ask, yeah. is Peter in this film? Because every review I've read, I know who a lot of the characters are, but Peter, I've never, I haven't seen anybody mention him yet. Uh, yeah, Peter, like, Peter is in it. There's Judas, there's Barabbas, there's, but yeah. Yeah, and I saw a cast list somewhere. I, th- I mean, I guess it was probably on the on the credits at the end of the film, but uh, where most of the disciples seem to be named, um, even though they don't really... Um, they don't all get a, a run a run out properly. Um okay. Peter Peter is in it. He's relatively minor. Uh well, yeah, he's pretty he's very minor. Um it's not very um positive portrayal of, of Peter, uh, I would say. Um actually, I mean, talking about um other black actors playing biblical characters, there's uh um Peter in Mary Magdalene, uh, the 2018 yes. film is played by um yeah, I Chewy. Can't. I think his nickname is Chewy. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no Chewy. I know how to spell it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I can't even remember how to spell it. But um, so yeah. So um, and that's. I mean, that's quite an unflattering. It's not as unflattering as that portrayal, but it's uh, the the disciples are kind of played a little bit like gatekeepers. Uh, yeah. that are kind of keep including Clarence's brother. Clarence's brother Thomas doesn't um want Clarence to become a disciple. Uh, Clarence is kind of interested at this one point thinking, you know, Jesus might offer him protection. Um, and and the other disciples also are kind of slightly, I mean, I guess it's, you know, there's, you do get that occasional thing in the gospel sometimes about the kind of disciples posturing a bit and, you know, oh, yeah. who, who's going to be the greatest. And, and I think it probably, it, it, pro- it plays much more down that line than the, than the, you know, they all become saints in the end kind of line. So, um, right. So yeah, um, so yeah, Peter is in it. Um, I made, think the Peter and killing. Do you remember killing Jesus with uh, Haas Sleeman playing uh, playing Jesus? Uh, only v- only vague, playing Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe Peter was played by a black actor in that film too. Uh, um, the 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 Peter I mean, and Mary Magdalene. It's worth saying on this that it's worth saying on this that oh. um, yeah, there were there were black. There were black Jews in in Jesus's day, um, and mm-hmm. in, in those times, you know, I mean, there's there's various kind of things that that point towards that. So, whether it be, I mean, for example, going right, I mean, this is you know a thousand years before, but if you go right back to Moses, Moses was said to have a, a Cushite wife, and presumably he wasn't the only person that um, <clears throat> that that was the case for. And those, you know, the descendants of those people were were around in Judaism. There were um, the the kind of the story of the Ethiopian Jews that. Um, had kind of left. Um, well, that's whilst it's on Wikipedia, it, but you know, there's there was you know a group of Jewish yeah. people that left around the time of the you know the fall of the temple and kind of were in it, were in Ethiopia and you know, and so there are yeah you know, there are various kind of little bits of pieces that, and and just in terms of proximity as well, um, you know, Israel, Judea. Was much, you know, was much more close to, you know, it was much more it was just, you know, right there in terms of Africa, and so that kind of the idea that it was almost, I mean, people have this kind of false idea about um, England that it was always kind of racially pure before the sixties, you know, pure white before the sixties, and that's, you know, I mean, that in itself is not has been demonstrated to not be true, but it's certainly not true, <laughs> you know, of Israel. It was a, you know, it was on that big route between the three major land masses. It was that kind of, you know, tiny little hinge. And so well, it, that's, you know, it that's kind of implicit in the place. book of Acts, isn't it? With the, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. I mean, it's, yeah. it appears yeah. that yeah. the Ethiopian eunuch was in Jerusalem to worship and the, mm. the conversion of that, of that Ethiopian in Acts chapter eight um, takes place before the conversion of the Romans in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius yeah. and the others. And the conversion of Cornelius causes a huge controversy which the Jewish followers of Jesus have to deal with. Do we allow yeah. non-Jews to become Christian? 
the story of the Ethiopian eunuch being baptized doesn't create that controversy. And now no. you could argue that because it takes place sort of off to the side, uh, it takes place outside Jerusalem, um, uh, where the church in Jerusalem doesn't see it happen, maybe. Yeah, but on the Philip other hand, and, Peter. Yeah. and it's Philip. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the book of Acts feels no need to explain this or justify this. It, no, it just no. it just happens. And so that's the and of course there is a long tradition there's a there's a jewish community in ethiopia that claims um ancestry going all the way back to king solomon and the queen of sheba and there's a similar uh, christian community in ethiopia that also claims descent going all the way back to that so that certainly exists yeah i, I find that the peter in the mary magdalene film um played by chueto geo4 i mean i really shouldn't keep saying that name if i'm not sure about the pronunciation but anyway um i find I find that performance um, interesting because, uh, I mean, he's a great actor and he, he does some really interesting yeah. things with that character. But what I find fascinating is that in real life, he has a British accent. Mm. In that film, he has a sort of a an African accent or a pseudo African accent. And he's the only character in the film that does, which to me fascinates me because in the Bible, the one time in the Gospels that accents are talked about it's yeah. because Peter is denying Jesus and the people outside the priest's courtyard say, hey, you talk just like a Galilean. You must be yeah. his father. And I found it so weird that in Mary Magdalene, he's the one disciple who doesn't talk like all the other Galileans. Yeah, I think I've only I've only I've only seen him in films. Um, I don't I don't remember see, hearing him interviewed. So um, that's really interesting to me that that um, that he's yeah, he's not talking in his standard um, yeah, no, I, I saw interviews course. he did when Mary Magdalene came out, and he, yeah. he clearly was talking like a Brit. He, that that yeah. was just his accent. And, uh, yeah. um, oh, so I just found it funny that he stands out in that film as talking differently from everybody else, whereas the yeah. one time accents are mentioned in the New Testament, it's because Peter does talk just like all the other Galileans. <laughs> so, yeah, I wonder, anyway. wonder, why they, wonder why they went with that. Interesting. Yeah. Um. Okay, so Jesus's family, that's interesting. Um, the yeah. other, uh, now you, um, what do you want to talk about first? The the false messiah thing or the comedy thing? Which note do you want to end on? Yeah, let's 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 go with, the, let's, let's talk about the false messiah thing. Because there's been a, I mean, okay. we, we, we kind of talked then about um, misconceptions that are out there about the film. And there's a few videos on YouTube now, you know, talking about the film being blasphemous or offensive. Um, and and I um, discussed it on a on a discussion forum I was part of to kind of just to kind of gauge um, people's reactions to it. And these were people that I thought would possibly be more. I don't know. Did I think that? I mean, it was a it, yeah. It was a, it was a it was a chosen discussion forum. So these are people that are used to watching um, dramatic portrayals of of Jesus. You know, they they what, they like what, them. What kind of portrayals? Dramatic. Sorry, did you say er erratic? Dramatic. Oh, dramatic. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, traumatic. No. <laughs> dramatic. No, no, no. Um... <laughs> er erratic is what I thought yeah, I heard. Yeah. E yeah. No, I, was, okay. I was just riffing. Yeah. Um, oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and also, you know, the, the chosen has you know has a kind of comic edge to it. It's you know, it's 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 it's, oh, yeah. it's serious drama, but there are. There are elements of it that where there's kind of levity brought to it by, by the kind of by bits and pieces. So it's so I was the kind of interested. Episode, to see it. Sorry, they're just about the chosen. Like episode yeah. three is one of the more famous episodes where Jesus hangs out with the children in the yeah. chosen. Like he makes farting noises. Like you know he plays yeah. raspberry. And... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, so so I kind of you know I was interested, but actually there were quite a lot of people there that had. Had either seen the trailer and been, oh, I think, well, you know, offended by it, or or thought it presented a false view of Jesus or whatever, um, and decided they weren't going to watch it. Through to not deciding, you know, not to watch it because um, Jay Z and Beyonce were involved in it, um, which I think. How are they involved? Well, I'm not quite. I think. I mean, I haven't looked into. I haven't looked into that to to clarify. But I think the claim made was that they were kind of involved in producers in some way. Or is it produced something? I think Jay Z and James Samuel are quite good, good friends. Um, 
because he's mentioned that in a couple of the things. But, um, but yeah. So, uh, yeah. And then, it, and and some of that I think is misconception because the trailer tries to, you know, I mean, trailers are all, you know, always a very abbreviated version. Um, and it's and I find it quite interesting because obviously we had the situation back in 1979 when Life of Brian came out, and um, there was there was kind of huge controversy with that film then. And a lot of it came, and and the kind of the the peak example of the controversy was there was this debate on uh, on British television between John Cleese and Michael Palin arguing for their film, and the then Bishop of Southwark and Malcolm Muggeridge arguing against it, and um, and famously they missed the first few minutes of the film, um, Muggeridge and the and the Bishop of Southwark, and and hadn't fully appreciated that you know this that brian clearly wasn't jesus um which you know you see it you know it's made very clear at the start of life of brian that brian isn't jesus um and and so and it's it's kind of similar with this film i think um in in terms of how the, in terms of what's been shown in the trailer that some people seem to think i think that that clarence is uh if he's a false you know he's a false messiah or he's you know he's playing He's playing kind of Jesus, or he's he's a, a mocking Jesus in in, in some way uh, as a character. Whereas essentially, you've got a very similar plot device in terms of you know Jesus is even more so. I think is a present character here as he's kind of presented as a um, as historical as any of the other characters are. Um, he is you know actively doing um, doing miracles. Um, the miracles are, are different from from how they're described in the bible um or different ones from the bible but there you know there isn't clarence doubts that jesus is the messiah clarence thinks that jesus is a fake um but he um but that's also shown you know not to be the case and i mean i, I, I guess we probably don't want to go into spoilers here but um but i think you know a key, um, a key so, so, so I think it's sorry. yeah. So sorry. So yeah. So I think it. You know. I think just to be clear on that, you know, that the, the two are clearly different figures, and Jesus is treated with uh, a level of respect relative to the rest of the, you know, relative to the rest of the film. And I certainly don't think Jesus is mocked in this film. Um, it just seemed obvious to me from the trailer that the trailer mm-hmm. has Jesus portrayed in these. I mean, it doesn't even really directly portray Jesus. It's sort of we get the sort of the the silhouette with the ha- like not a halo, but sort of like a light behind him. Yeah. Um, and and um, it's very clear that Jesus is over there and Clarence is over here and that Clarence yeah. is copying Jesus, which um, I mean, two things about that from my point of view, just as one who saw the trailer one um one key difference between life of brian and this it, it appears is that in life of brian he's accidentally sort of mistaken for a messiah it's yeah. life of brian is all is all about how people make mistakes they don't mm. hear things correctly and they, they make assumptions and brian is just sort of like you know carried Sounds along by this wave yeah. of misunderstandings whereas uh clarence is very clearly trying to mm. um attract the following he's doing it for the money or for the whatever yeah. and and yet it's very clear he's faking it and then the second thing is of course it, the biblical jesus himself warns people against false messiahs yeah. and like i don't see how any bible believing christian could object to a film that explores what it might have been like if there were false messiahs at that time yeah. because jesus himself said there would be yeah and and i guess similarly i mean you know Je- yeah, people have said that the film's mocking Jesus. Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, there probably are lines of dialogue where that might be the case, but but the film isn't mocking Jesus. There are characters around the story that mocking Jesus, and we and we know from the Gospels that those people were around as well. That they, you know, said that, um, you know, that spat on him or uh, um, the lines escape me now. But um, like he's a glutton yeah. and a drunkard. That's the one. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. I, all I was getting was. Uh, beer is a brawler in <laughs> wine from the last proverbs or something, isn't it? But, um, but, but yeah, but that's a uh, glutton and a drunkard. So, so we, you know, we, we know that these were the, you know, the things people, people, yeah, just because a character in a story mocks Jesus doesn't mean that the overall thing is mocking Jesus. Um, or else you'd have to have a problem with the gospels. So, 
so yeah so i don't think i mean i think if people are it doesn't it does, as a film it doesn't adopt a hushed, hushed reverence for for any of the characters particularly um and i you know and i get that some people this will not be their cup of tea and they won't you know and they won't particularly won't particularly work for their faith but i think it's it's a shame when people have kind of decided on you know on a, either a misunderstanding or on a basis you know some kind of like um trigger happy <laughs> I uh, think that 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 you know that it's a certain kind of thing when it when it isn't that it's you know it's a kind of it's yeah it is a it's a comedy drama and it, it does that by kind of a lot of the comedy is in caricature and in in kind of that humor of those um of those characters in that in that time and that that translation of those characters from that day into this day um it's not um you know, it's kind of borders on farce in places, but um, Jesus, I think within that, within that overall thing is, is respectfully, is respectfully treated. Um, yeah. And I think for some people's taste, possibly too, too much. I think some of the reviews, I think you picked up on that in one of your Substack posts about it, that, um, that, that some critics I think had found it, you know, not enjoyed the, the end of the film as much as the first two chapters. Uh, the impression I get is that the, because apparently the film is divided into three sections, and mm. apparently the consensus seems to be the third section is more serious than the first two. And most critics that I've seen so far seem to think that the film is at its most enjoyable when it's going for the the funniness and the the um, the comedy or whatever, and then as it gets closer to the end, it gets more serious and they kind of lose interest. I do. I did find one critic who felt that the film actually got better as it went because he thought it got more coherent. Yeah. He found, he found the early comedy bits a little more sort of like all over the place and um, style over substance. And, and then gradually it, it felt like it felt like it was coming together for him. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, um I mean, what, what's your take on that? The, 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 you, you called it a comedy yeah. drama. The impression I get is that the comedy and the drama don't necessarily mesh or overlap. Like people talk, some of the, a lot of the reviews talk about tonal shifts mm. um, how, and how jarring the shifts in tone can be over the course of that film. Yeah, I think they, I think they, they I think that's probably, I was going to say it's a fair comment. I don't know if it's necessarily a fair comment, but I think it, I think the tone does shift. Um, not necessarily as neatly as those first three acts. There's still there's still comic elements in that final section, um, and you know, quite to to you know to quite a kind of good extent, I think really. Um, but it does have a bit more of a sense of, yeah. I I mean I can see the point of view of the person that says it feels like it it it, it focuses down a bit more um, and gets a bit more of a sense of what it is. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm still. I'm still trying to think about that. I think it's probably the kind of thing I'll pick up a bit more a second time. Um, and and I guess in, you know, in some ways, I'm I'm conscious of um, trying to think how how best to say this. But um, I I think the people that when when the director thought about this film, I mean, he's he's been talking. He's been you know thinking about it for 20 years or something, I think he said. And I think his his very top audience for this film is probably that kind of um is probably uh kind of black Londoners, I think. Um you know, that that kind of community um and that kind of humor. And and so I'm slightly outside of that. And I and I kind of feel at times that um that that's yeah that i guess i'm you know i'm happy with no, I, you know i don't have a problem with that i um but it, it feels like some of those some of those shifts in tones and some of those other things are are about the kind of yeah i, I suppose that again this idea of taking up those communities you grew up in and translating it back into the past and i think that you know and they're the people that he he was really making this film for the people that come from those um those same communities um and 
and just as if I, you know, when I watch um, some Italian comedies, there was an Italian comedy in 2019 uh, talking about Italian nativity films. Um, yeah, that that was there was a kind of comic comic take on on the nativity, um, and just as in t- at times in that there were probably more so in that there were times when I felt that I could see there was a humor yeah humor that was content that was um that was uh oh, I can't think what the word is um but yeah that was kind of working for the people that were familiar with it and that was their their comedy language so to speak and but it was a slightly different context for me and it didn't quite work for me and I think I think there's a bit of that with with the film that you know it didn't feel like everything landed with me um but I could imagine how um people that were more familiar with that context would would find that that funny than I did um so I I can't remember where we started from now but um we were talking about the whole false messiah thing and we were going to yeah. talk about the comedy. It feels like we sort of segued into the comedy already anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well it, yeah, I suppose it's yeah, it's gonna it's gonna happen. So so yeah, so I think it I mean I think it is a comedy drama rather than a comedy. Um it okay. because it does I mean, yeah, I mean again Life of Brian was about something. Um and I think that's uh partly why it's such a yeah such a kind of strong film, but it, it felt like it, I suppose it had less of a, there there kind of is a narrative in Life of Brian. I mean, there is a narrative in Life of Brian, but it feels like it's it's there along for the ride a bit more. Whereas I think with the Book of um, book of Clarence, it feels like the, yeah, there's that kind of, that, that kind of story feels like it's a bit more prominent and it isn't, you know, in life of Brian, it's kind of driven along by the fact that Brian fancies Judas, and and right. kind of you know wants to join the uh, PFJ to impress her, and you know the kind of things things then kind of take off from there. Um, whereas whereas this feels like it's you know, I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean even your face as I, I'm saying that, you know, it kind of the the, the yeah the 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 narrative thread in life of Brian I think is fairly. It, it's it fits more than quest for the holy grail and certainly more than um uh the other one um but it um oh, of life? yeah the meaning of life um well, hold, hold, but it doesn't they're have both, a, they're it doesn't both have very sex oriented like and and holy grail feels yeah. very episodic and and meaning of life is quite literally just like a series of yeah. vignettes yeah yeah so so meaning of life is you know is very is definitely kind of entire you know separate separate yeah. sketches um there's a kind of overhanging thing with with um uh quest of the holy grail life of brian i think part of the reason it's the best of the python films is it because it does have that bit more sense of being together and fitting but yeah. it still feels it i think it still feels a little bit less cohesive than it than it could be um Whereas, whereas I think this feels much more like it's it's got more of a a sense of a of a of a character character arcs and that kind of thing. Um, okay, would be my take on it. <laughs> You'll watch it now and wonder what was on about. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I, at one point, my my eyes sort of darted around because when you said PFJ, I my instinct was to wonder if uh, if you were identifying the right group because which particular group of revolutionaries. <laughs> um please represents as a major major point of contention in that film so yeah there's like yeah. the people's front the popular front and the people's popular front and all the rest of it and so yeah pfj it's like hmm, which, anyway, whatever i th- I think you're right though i think he does say that they are the pfj at one point yeah i think yeah, yeah i think that, i think i'm right about that but yeah er- eric idol has said that uh um has said that life of brian is interesting because it's the only python film that actually ha- makes a positive statement um, about the need to think for yourself, about the need to be an individual, um, mm-hmm. which is immediately treated, that, that point is made in the film and it's immediately turned into a catalyst for more humor. Yeah. But um, that's Eric Idle's view, at least anyway, that Life of Brian actually does assert, it does make a point, whereas the yeah. other the other Python films are largely just having fun with stuff. Yeah. And... Uh, 
whereas Life of Brian arguably has a message. Um, oh, I think he definitely and, does, yeah. Yeah, and Book of Clarence apparently also has some sort of like redemptive arc, or maybe not, I don't know if redemptive is the right word, but but it has some sort of arc for the character of Clarence that maybe yeah. also makes it more than just, um, you know, a joke fest or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's. I think that's definitely true, and I think that's why. I, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it feels like, it feels like the the kind of that narrative arc as well is. I don't want to say in the driving seat exactly, but it, but that that. It it doesn't get too lost. It doesn't kind of get too lost in doing the kind of comics and the skits and the, and the various bits and the and the jokes and those kind of things. It. It, yeah, I, th I think it, it, it could have, I think it could have crammed more jokes in there and made kind of more scenarios and that kind of thing. Um, but it, I think it, it felt to me like it was choosing to, to make sure it had a, you know, it had a, a story that was, you know, that had, a, that it had a story and that it was, it was kind of going somewhere with it. Um, okay. Well, uh, the film comes out in January. Uh, mm -hmm. We're we're almost out of time on Zoom here, but um, um, the the film comes out January twelfth, at least in North America. But as far as I know, worldwide, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to being able to talk about it once I've actually seen it. Oh no! Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be great. Sorry, just froze it for a moment then. But yeah, that'd oh, be no problem. Yeah. Yeah, that, well, perhaps we can uh, have another discussion about it then. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Cool. All right, well, and once again, Matthew's book, Thank 100 you. Bible Films. A lot of great things in here, a lot of obscure films, uh, a lot of not-so-obscure films. I mean, obviously, there are Aronofsky's Noah on the cover. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, maybe in some future edition, we'll get Book of Clarence in there. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If it gets reprinted. Talk to you later. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>